Hello and welcome to another video. So in this video, I'm going to be going over things to think about when considering using power armor or exosuits in the world of today, particularly comparing to things like medieval armor as well as armor from sci-fi settings. As I have absolutely tons of great comments in my comment sections, comments of actual intelligence and thought that I actually learn from, which is far more than I've actually found in everyday life in real life. But there are some that it's not particularly that they are incorrect, it's just the fact that perhaps they haven't thought about the subject quite as deeply as I have, probably because they've actually got a life and not actually decided to build their own powered armoured exoskeleton. So firstly we will start with medieval armour, particularly the highest end of medieval armour, the ones made by the master craftsmen of the 14, 15, 1600s, all made for the wealthiest of clientele, the nobles and kings, of which these suits were basically like the big guys of the day. Now I think one of the most relevant and practical things to think about when comparing medieval armour to potential exosuits of today is the issue of serfs and peasants. So when it came to those elite medieval suits of armour, they would naturally have a bunch of peasants and serfs and perhaps squires following the knight around as part of their caravan and that would include, of course, helping armour the knight up. Which, if you watch some videos on YouTube, which I'm sure plenty of you watching this actually have, the amount of layers, the chainmail, the strapping that you'd have to put on, it's not really something you're going to be able to practically do on your own. Now, there were, of course, simpler sets of medieval armour where perhaps you could put them on on your own. But either way, if you want to get into the more intricate level with the overlapping pieces, any extra plate armour to provide more coverage, that is something that you really need help with. Also, another part to consider of that is if you are wearing them, if you were wearing medieval armour in these times, again, the serfs and peasants would basically do anything for you that you might struggle with while wearing the armour. But in today's modern world, if you're wearing an exosuit, that's not the case. So simple everyday tasks that might be difficult in a full, full suit of medieval armour. These are tasks you would just have to have to do by yourself in an exosuit. One of which is actually just looking down. So a problem with wearing, say, a big gorget to help cover your neck is that it will limit your vision as you look down, making things like holding a phone and operating a phone down in front of you a difficult task to achieve, but a task that you, the operator, will have to be able to do. And that goes for the same with helmets. It's no good having to hold a phone up here to operate it. You need to actually hold it down by your waist as you would do if you weren't wearing a suit which is also the same for any type of pouches that you might have on you, whether that's on a belt or on a chest. Ideally, it's good to be able to just look down and actually see what you're doing, which is another thing to add to that in the modern world. You really need to be able to look down where you're going, where you're walking, whether you're going down steps or walking through any unstable ground, whether that's factories or just in general, particular urban environments. Now, of course, medieval knights would have to navigate their share of terrain on that point, but the modern world is just way more complicated. And also, human beings have got way more bigger since those days, while doorways haven't actually got that much bigger. So everything is much tighter. So again, you do really need to be able to look down at where you're walking at your feet. To contrast that to the sci-fi universe of Warhammer 40,000, you can see in this clip from the Tides, you have Captain Malachi of the White Templars taking his helmet off, and you can see how big his chest plate is and how big his gorget is, and there is no way he could actually see his hands in front of him if they were down by his waist. This is a boring practicality that you've got to deal with and got to get working. That is also why I currently don't have a form of gorget on my chest plate, literally because you need to be able to look down to do everyday tasks. Which gives me opportunity to slightly mention looking up. Now, looking up, frankly, isn't as important as looking down, in my opinion. However, when you're comparing to medieval armor, they were basically all roughly fighting on the feet, whether that was swords or pikesmen or archers. Whereas really since World War I, perhaps even before that, being able to lay down in the prone position and use whatever weapon you have has been very important. So you do actually need to be able to look up with whatever your helmet you're wearing and whatever armor you've got on. Another main thing when comparing to medieval armor, which I have mentioned before, is basic armor thickness, particularly on these solid plates. So back in medieval times, if I've got it right, plate armor was typically one to three millimeters thick, which is very thin, frankly which makes the armor naturally very light and also makes it easier to actually form it into curves, which can help from the protection point of view. Whereas I think any sort of modern power armor for it to stop any decent sized ballistics is always going to be a relatively thick armor. 
I'm generally using 20 millimeters as a round figure for mine, even though it is a little bit less and certainly less in different places. But going off 20 millimeters is a safe bet. What this does mean is you can't have all of these little overlapping features, whether that's the footwear of medieval armor or things that say cover the elbows and the joints, where they have all these intricate, beautifully crafted overlapping pieces that cover the joints. With the armor being too thick for that, you can't have the overlap because it'll either be too bulky or it'll weigh too much. This can create problems like covering the gaps over the shoulders, something I kind of mentioned in a pauldron video not so long ago. As there is an amount of freedom of movement you need in your arms in particular that I found, which was that basically you need to be able to cross your arms like that and have one arm touch the shoulder on the other arm to adjust anything there. That is such a tiny, inconsiderable movement when you're not wearing armor, but if you're putting the armor on and you've got to do that and you can't do that, it basically means it's impossible to do some form of task. Now to achieve that movement, it does mean the chest plate can't be that wide, and then you need another form of coverage to actually cover the gap of the shoulder and the chest, which can be pauldrons. The problem with pauldrons is they just get too big and too heavy. So in my case, I'm going for a flexible armored poncho slash mantle that basically goes over the shoulders and hangs down to here. That way I can cover it best while it's been flexible. But the point is due to the armor thickness, you can't really have these intricate shoulder pieces that you'd have in medieval armor because at the bare minimum, they'd get so big, you wouldn't be able to fit through doorways. Which actually brings me nicely onto the transport side of this. And that's that for practicality reasons, the exosuits need to be at least somewhat compatible with the larger vehicles that are currently readily available. Now that could be modified civilian vehicles or currently military vehicles, but if you're gonna have to make a completely custom vehicle to transport the exosuits in, the cost for that is quite large and will make it much harder to use any form of exosuit wherever it may be needed. Which brings me neatly onto transport and logistics. The main thing I think to note here is that back in the medieval times, because say, like the French at the Battle of Agincourt, is that most of the well-armored knights were actually the nobles fighting for their land slash having a good scrap with their mates. This meant that a massive amount of people and logistics would essentially be put into serving that one noble, that one knight. Whereas today, such an amount of logistics and effort doesn't really go into supporting the one individual, although it might go into a mission that only supports a few individuals. In general, the modern logistics train is really to serve machines. For example, a lot of logistical effort is put into keeping a column of tanks going. To such a degree that if I have it right, a temporary pipeline was actually run from England in the Second World War to France to make sure there was a constant supply of fuel. This is a massive amount of effort and resource to put in to keep that logistics train door going, to keep the transport of all that going, and to keep the supply lines full. So with how much effort we put into that already, whether it's to keep tanks going, to keep helicopters going, as well as all the regular stuff like keeping soldiers fed and everything like that, actually adding exosuits into the supply chain isn't that big of a deal putting extra effort to have a few more vehicles on while ideally not specialist vehicles, but just regular vehicles that either have light modifications or just can be used alongside them. Putting these extra vehicles and extra systems and processes in place to cater for exosuits in a modern military sense, I don't think is that big of a deal. Whether that's bringing some extra generators along to charge battery packs up or adding an extra couple of loads to carry some spare parts. When considering what it takes to say run helicopters out of a forward operating base practically in the middle of nowhere, it's just not that big of a deal. Which is why the common issue that people generally bring up, which is power source, battery packs, etc. As long as the battery pack is modular, can be changed out easily with differing versions for differing mission statements, all of that, as long as they are modular and easily changeable, I really don't think that the battery side of this is actually that much of a problem. Again, there's loads of examples from military history where we've put way bigger effort into modifying or creating a complete new supply chain for a new thing. That really having to have a supply chain with some batteries to charge isn't that big of a deal. So I think that's about enough for this video. There is of course way more things that I could add into future videos. But if there's anything you think I have missed, please feel free to comment down below. The next video on the next prototype will be the back pieces as well as the plan for the power pack and where to put the electronics. So if you're new to the channel and that interests you, please feel free to like and subscribe. 
and share it wherever you can. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you have a great day.